Lilu might just be the most interesting investor to ever live. Bold claim, but hear me out. Born during the Cultural Revolution, his parents get sent away to labour camps so he bounces around peasant families that could take him in. Survives the Great Tangshan Earthquake, where all of his foster family perishes. He not only participates, but also helps lead the Tiananmen Square protests of 1989, and he ends up on China's most wanted list. Flees China, ends up in the US, where he then becomes a world-class value investor and best buds with Charlie Munger. Not a bad story. Sound interesting? Let's dive in deeper. Li Lu's story begins in April 1966, when he was born in the coastal industrial city of Tangshan in northeastern China. His father was a Soviet-educated engineer, and his mother a botanist and the daughter of a rich landlord. Although, only one month later after being born, Mao Zedong would begin China's Cultural Revolution, the aim of which was to preserve Chinese communism by purging remnants of capitalist and traditional elements from Chinese society, and reimpose Mao Zedong thought, aka Maoism, as the dominant ideology in the PRC. Due to his parents being intellectuals, they were both denounced as class enemies and were sent off to labour camps. Lee's mother first being sent away not long after he was born, and then his father later on was listening to a foreign broadcast on the radio and someone overheard accusing his father of being a foreign spy. So he was sent away to a coal mine in order to be re-educated. Lee Lu's grandfather was also an intellectual that was incarcerated, but his story becomes important later. Luckily, Lee's parents had been able to pay various other families to take him in while they had been forced away. One of his father's friends, an illiterate coal miner known as Darpa, agreed to take Lee in and had a huge impact on his life. Darpa would sadly die in a mine explosion when Lee was around seven or eight, leaving Darma, his foster mother, alone to raise six kids. Even Darma's son, Lauda, the oldest one, had to take his father's job in the coal mine, aged only 15, to make ends meet. So since Lee Lu's parents were now being rehabilitated, he was allowed back to stay with them, even if, as he says, he felt awkward with his parents and they were like strangers to him. But whilst things were far from perfect, they were still about to get a whole lot worse. Having survived the Cultural Revolution, and only a few months before Mao Zedong would eventually die, one of the deadliest earthquakes ever struck Tangshan. In the early morning, just before 4am on the 28th of July 1976, the magnitude 7.6 quake struck the city, with initiative damage and hysteria being so bad that Lee recounts in his book that some people were screaming that the USA had dropped an atomic bomb. Lee had luckily stayed at his parents' flat on the night of the earthquake, along with his brother and aunt, all who luckily survived. But his foster family, who he was so fond of, Dharma and the kids, were not so lucky. Lee ran to their house, but all he found was the house caved in and the roof still standing. Little Six, the youngest child and the one most fond of Lee, was barely alive, begging Lee for help, but he would eventually die. Only Lal Da, Dharma's eldest son, survived from that family, but even then, the whole lower half of his body was crushed. In total, the Tangshan earthquake is estimated as the third deadliest in history, with over 242,000 deaths. But the earthquake and its aftermath also caused the start of Li Lu's distrust and aversion to the government, a key moment that would snowball later on. The soldiers and the party officials are grabbing all the things available for relief for themselves or their family. Older people just don't get anything, so I developed a tremendous aversion, you know, hatred toward those people. By the time Lee was almost nine years old, he had lived with nine different families, lived through the Cultural Revolution and had survived the Great Tangshan Earthquake. Yet his unreal story was only in its infancy. By 1985, Lee had completed his high school education and decided to attend Nanjing University to study semiconductor physics before later transferring to economics. Nanjing is the capital of China's eastern Jiangsu province and about a thousand kilometres away from the capital Beijing, a key point that pops up later on. In 1985 at Nanjing University, Li Li was actually a member of the Chinese Communist Party, would you believe? He hated the religious seeming worship of the party, but still believed that in China it was essential to try to reform the Communist Party from within. Unsurprisingly, he was quickly disillusioned and dropped out, though still wondering how reform may be possible. A few years later, on April 15, 1989, Hu Yaobang died. Hu was an advocate for political reform and was a young man on the long march with Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping. In 1987, he had defended the students' demands for reform and had been expelled from his post as General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. His death sparked an outpouring of support across the country. At Nanjing University, posters appeared for Hu, praising his efforts and the good he had done in his life. But by the next day, the slogans and posters were changing from memorials to Hu into criticism of the current state of affairs. The crisis is in education and the economy the lack of morality, the rampant corruption of officials, 
resistance of leaders to political reforms, Deng Xiaoping's autocracy, and the suppression of freedom in the media. Very quickly, and unsurprisingly because of the location in the capital, Tiananmen Square in Beijing became the place to work for change. But Li Lu was a thousand kilometres away in Nanjing. To say that Li was an active participant in the Tiananmen Square protests would be a massive understatement. He basically helped run it. He helped lead it. But it wasn't so simple for Li to initially attend and join the movement. Li Lu arrived in Beijing with nothing but underwear in his pocket on the 27th of April, a day after the April 26th editorial, which was a key turning point because the CCP effectively branded the student movement as an anti-party, anti-government revolt. This enraged the students and made it a major sticking point for the remainder of the protests. Other student protesters were sceptical of Li Lu, given he was from Nanjing, but also because he had no documents on him, even though it was common at the time for students participating in order to avoid repercussions. Luckily, Chai Ling, described as a spiritual leader of the protests, trusted Li Lu early on and stuck up for him, often when people attacked his character and credentials. At one point during the protests, his girlfriend from Nanjing, Zhao Ming, surprised him in Tiananmen Square. So Li Lu and Zhao Ming decided in the spur of the moment to get married. I thought about life and love in abstract and how much things that life could offer at the age of 23 with such a beautiful young bride. <laughs> And I asked her, do you want to marry? She said, why not? <laughs> I thought of a lot of things, but finally end up saying just two sentences. I said, uh, um, we came here not just for death, or not for death at all. We're here to look for a life that is worth of living. We need to struggle for that life, and we also need marry. Let's continue the struggle. Let the beloved also get married. Follow my example, that's it. And then immediately I send two of my best friends to escort her back to home. I told her I will go to look for her. Afterwards, if I'm still alive. So they went and uh, never see her again. That's rough, buddy. As the protests went on, things deteriorated and the tank stormed Tiananmen, Lee went into hiding. With the aid of people smugglers, party officials, and the common folk, he was helped from Beijing southwards and then through the aid of people smugglers, of all people, smuggled out in a boat to Hong Kong and then onwards to France. Lee was assisted by Operation Yellowbird, a Hong Kong-based operation to help those students who participated in the protests a chance to escape overseas. Overall, Operation Yellowbird helped over 400 dissidents by smuggling them through Hong Kong and onwards to Western countries by applying for visas on their behalf. From the ocean, you begin to see some lights of the high towers of Hong Kong. And that was the first time in my life I ever seen such kind of thing. It was, a, it represented kind of different worlds different civilization, completely foreign to me. I don't know whether it's dangerous uh, or not. I don't know what lied ahead of me. But why did Li Lu escape to France originally and not to the US, where he eventually ended up and made a name for himself? People in Hong Kong had been applying on behalf of Li and other dissidents for political asylum. The United States was asked originally, but came back with that they would not take political refugees from Tiananmen Square, so France was the only country that would take them at the time. Eventually, Lee would make his way to America, and luckily had a place to stay thanks to Mary Daly, who he speaks so fondly of. When I first escaped from Tiananmen Square, and everybody was asking me all those deep philosophical questions like, what's the democratic prospect in China? Mary patiently waited for everyone to quiet down and then asked me, do you have a place to stay? Do you have any other clothes you can change into? And of course, the answer to both questions was no. So basically, for my first six months in America, I literally stayed in Mary's living room, so Li Lu had a place to stay, but what to do now? Even though Li had previously studied for about three and a half years at Nanjing University, unsurprisingly, he couldn't get a hold of his old transcripts. So it was back to square one in terms of studying. And this is where Li's grandfather comes back into the picture. So his grandfather, Zhu Qishan, had previously received his PhD from Columbia. And whilst Li Lu had never met him, since he died when Li was about one year old in the Cultural Revolution, he had a massive influence on him. This quote from Li sums it up well. He left behind lots of unpublished manuscripts, and I read them over and over. He was always a hero in my mind as I grew up, 
That's partly why I chose to come to Colombia. My family has a heritage here, but that heritage is larger than that. It includes a heritage of certain ideals and principles. I feel that my grandfather got them from Colombia, and I have received them both from my grandfather and Colombia. Over the summer, Lee enrolled in the American Language Program at Columbia so he could learn English. So from 8am to 8pm every day over summer, he had his English classes. In the fall, he was later placed into the School of General Studies, where he started his university education all over again. New York was totally alien to me. I had never seen or experienced anything like it. The whole experience was quite overwhelming. There are all sorts of freedom here, but in a way that heightened my sense of guilt. When I first arrived, I hardly spoke any English and that increased my sense of loneliness and isolation. I was lucky to meet Mary Daly, and through her, Trudy Styler. I think Trudy came round to the house one day and I was introduced to her, but I had no idea who she was or what she did. I met Sting later and I'd never heard of him. I just thought they were both very nice and kind. So through Mary Daly, he obviously met Trudy Styler, who at that time was an actress in her own right, but also married to a musician you may have heard of called Sting. He has a few decent songs, but... Styler became a key role in Lee's life, initially giving him a big bag full of Sting's clothes when he first arrived, helping Lee write his book and visit the publisher in London, and then later on bought the film rights to Lee Lu's book and created the Moving the Mountain documentary. There was never a question in my mind that she would make the documentary of my book. I trust her completely. I place great value on the friends I've made in the West. Trudy will be my friend until the day I die. Of that, I am certain. Oh, friend! With royalties from the book, as well as fees earned from giving lectures, he made investments and rode the bull market to the $125,000 he needed to pay his living costs and the tuition not covered by his scholarship. And with friends like Mary Daly and Trudy Styler, they would help drive the next chapter of Lee's life, becoming the legendary investor. So while Lee Lu would eventually grow into a formidable investor in his own right, the beginnings of which involve a good deal of luck and humour, Lee Lu in his own words said, I always had this fear in the back of my mind about how I was going to make a living here. I didn't even think about success at the time. I just wanted to pay my bills. I grew up in communist China and never had much money to my name. And then all of a sudden I had giant student loans. So naturally I tried to make a buck or two. One day, about two years after I arrived, a friend of mine who knew my issues said, if you really want to make money, you have to listen to this fellow. He truly knows how to make money. I wasn't so sure what it was all about. I just remember thinking there was a buffet involved. So I assumed it was some kind of talk with a free lunch. I thought it was a good combination. A free lunch plus a talk about how to make money. So I went. To my dismay, there was no lunch. It was just a guy with the name Buffett. But the saint said all you can eat. But the ideals of value investing really struck a chord with Lilu. Mr. Buffet really made a lot of sense during that talk. It was like a punch in my eyes. It was like I'd just woken up and a light had switched on. At that time, I couldn't really start companies, and I didn't want to work in a big company because of the differences in language and culture. Investing, on the other hand, sounded like it required a lot of reading and mathematics, hard work and good judgement. I was confident I could do those things well, and the fundamental principles of value investing appealed to me. Buy good securities at a bargain price. If you're wrong, you won't lose a lot, but if you're right, you're going to make a lot. It fit my personality and temperament very well. So when it came time to make a living out of college, Lee worked a summer at white shoe law firm Simpson, Thatcher and Bartlett, put in four months at the media investment banking firm Allen & Company, and then spent two years as a corporate finance associate at another investment banking firm, Donaldson, Lufkin and Gent Rett. But the work that went with pleasing clients didn't sit well with Lee Lu. It was very hard for me in the service business. I want to make up a decision and do it. I'm a doer rather than just giving ideas. Lee Lu's saviour from the service side of business came in the form of Rena Shulsky, a Manhattan real estate magnate who he had met while giving a lecture. It was a red-eye flight from San Francisco to New York in 1997, and she encouraged him to start a fund. I thought he could do better than working at DLJ, she said, and it's not just advice she gave. She also gave him $2 million in seed money to get started. That conversation and $2 million of capital was the launching pad for starting Himalaya Partners first as a hedge fund, and then adding a venture fund later on. Some investors in his fund included Bob Bernstein, who was the Random House chairman and originally helped Lee gain asylum in the United States in his role as the board president of the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, the musician Sting, and Jerome Kohlberg, the founder of KKR, just to name a few. Pretty average lineup of investors, I reckon. His first year going out alone was not a good one. 
It was 1998, and his fund, which was chiefly invested in Asian stocks, was hammered by the Asian debt crisis and lost 19%. I felt bad that people had trusted me. All they knew was I was a student activist, and all they saw was losses. Luckily, it was only a small blip to start his career, and he made the money back the following year in the bull market that followed. Later on, in 2002, even Julian Robertson, the founder of Tiger Management, gave money to Lilu to manage. When I ran my fund, early on in my career, Julian Robertson, the founder of Tiger Fund, invited me to share an office with him. He invited lots of fund managers that he invested money with to work together and share ideas. But this relationship would eventually fall apart because Robertson insisted Lee short, which Lee wasn't too fond of. Shorting was one of the worst mistakes I've made. But Lee Lu was a natural fit for value investing, and given his temperament and thought process, he explains why he loved investing so much. You prove to them you're good, people trust you. They don't ask how many years I've managed a fund. The question is, can you make me money? Show me the money. This is one area where if you really believe you're smart, and you're unique, and you're different, this can be challenging, this is it. Because if you're right, you make a lot. If you're wrong, you lose a bundle. So having already come into contact, although briefly, with Warren Buffet at the start of his investment journey, he would eventually forge a strong relationship with the Oracle's right-hand man, Charlie Munger himself. Leela had first met Munger through his human rights contact, Jane Olson, who was the wife of Ron Olson, a Berkshire director and early partner of Munger, Tollins and Olson in 2003. Munger and Lee quickly bonded over a suspicion of financial companies' reported earnings. And I quote, don't like the bullshit. Munger's thoughts on Lee Lu are incredibly complimentary, but I think his actions say more than his words. Because as far as I could understand researching this, Lee is a sole outsider in Charlie's life who he's invested with. Munger in his interview alongside Lee Lu for Weekly Stocks said that the Mungers basically have three investments. Berkshire Stock, Costco, and the investment in Lee Lu's partnership. No mean feat, having one of the greatest investors of all time choosing your fund as one of only three investments. So after everything, would you believe that Li Lu has been back to China? Apparently, Li is able to travel within China nowadays, although on a limited basis, but is hoping to gain full travel privileges in the future. So just how does one of the student leaders and one of the most influential during one of the most violent and famous protests in China end up doing so much business with them and be accepted back? Is it money? Is it silence? Especially with the CCP being so strict and sensitive on these types of issues, he's been allowed to give lectures at Peking University and apparently has guided Bill Gates and Warren Buffett around the BYD factory. But this blog article is the only insight into the situation that I could find. As Buffett and Gates toured BYD in Shenzhen, Li Lu was among them. A reporter for Hong Kong newspaper Ming Daily describes the scene as highly controlled. Reporters are allowed to photograph Buffett, but not his entourage. But Li Lu could still be spotted. The newspaper said that Li Lu entered China with an American passport with special permission by the Chinese authority. This is the very first confirmed case that one of the 21 most wanted student leaders who escaped abroad is allowed to visit their home country. The truth of the matter and reasoning for why Li Lu has been allowed to return on trips is not quite knowable. I don't think it's controversial to say that things have gotten worse in terms of individual freedoms and liberties since Tiananmen. Another dissident who participated in 1989 highlights what life is like for those that participated. Wu Orakeshi characterised exile as a form of mental torture, saying that he was prepared to face the consequences of returning to Beijing, including jail time, if it meant he was able to see his parents again. Instead, he lives in a neo-authoritarian Netherland, full of desire to go home to the country seeking his arrest, but which also refuses to arrest him. Wu Orakeshi has tried repeatedly to go home, Chinese authorities have turned away each time, in Macau in 2009, the Chinese embassy in Tokyo in 2010, and the Chinese embassy in Washington DC in 2012. It's unknown how the CCP truly views Li and their reasons for allowing him to travel back in China, even if it is limited. And it's unknown how Li views the CCP back. Can he visit his parents, assuming they're still around? As of January 1995, Lee mentioned that his father was one of China's top scientists and had a program that he conducted with the US and a European country, my guess would be Russia, but he is no longer allowed to travel anywhere anymore. Anymore, But he was also uh, one of China's top scientists, um, and therefore there's still values to be used. So he continued his current job and probably about to retire next year and receive a relatively little harassment this time, but he paid his dues during Cultural Revolution. Li Lu also has a brother that's barely ever mentioned. I could only find one mention of it in the book. But is Li able to see or contact him? 
And whatever happened to Zhao Ming, who he married in Tiananmen Square? As Sting said, love can mend your life or love can break your heart. All these questions, and I doubt it's something we'll ever know, but it's worth wondering about. But what does Li Lu think of those that accuse him of abandoning his cause? I need a profession, because I think he can't just be a professional dissident. In a 1996 New Yorker article, James Troll writes, Li Lu explained that he has a long-term strategy to mobilise the overseas Chinese whose investment has been fueling China's growth. He regards himself as an improbable survivor and a tribune for those who suffered at Tiananmen Square. Before Li Lu himself later says, If I ever lost that sight, that would be the moment my life kind of ended, because at that moment I would have lost my sense of morality. I have always had the sense that once and again I will be summoned by history. I just worry that time won't be enough for me to prepare myself, to make myself ready when the call comes. I just regarded life as a um, ongoing test. Each person has a potential opportunity to make some kind of differences. And I have decided a long time that there is something, there is one thing that worth of uh, throwing whole of my life that is to change China. Either way, Li Lu has my favourite background of any investor, and possibly any individual. Tom Bernstein describes the legend of Li Lu the best. We kid about Li Lu. If he said that someone was going to make a billion dollars and be the head of the largest country in the world all in one lifetime, he could be the guy. But I want to finish with a Li Lu quote from his reflections on reaching 50. I think it sums up the great man and gives some great advice in the process. Woody Allen is right. 90% of success is to show up. At various stages in my life, I could have stopped or took the long rest. For some reason, my heart told me otherwise. I just kept going. Half of the time, I wasn't even sure where I was heading. The other half, I was probably taking the wrong turns. No matter. If you enjoyed this video, flick it a like, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future updates and feel free to leave a comment for what videos you'd like to see covered in the future. Until next time, have a good one.